I'd like to introduce Doug Letterman, the editor and co-founder of Inside Higher Education, and he will uh, introduce our panelists. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I don't know if your brain's starting to hurt like mine tends to do at these events where I'm absorbing so much information, but uh, we're, we're going to try to help you work through that. Uh, I'm Doug Letterman, as Ginny said. I'm one of the editors and co-founders of Inside Higher Ed, which is a free daily online publication that aims to bring the sort of mystifying world of higher education uh, to, to people in an understandable way. And um, uh, we have the, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be up here with these two gentlemen. Um, we have a very broad topic, uh, rewiring college to career, getting a degree that works. The nice thing about that is that allows us to talk about just about anything we want that falls under that umbrella. And so we're going to try to make a coherent a whole out of all this. Um, basically, the, the sort of theme that we're going to try to talk through a little bit, and I think it'll tee up a lot of the discussion. It plays a little bit off some of this morning's discussions, but will tee up this afternoon's discussions, I think, pretty well, is the, is the question of whether our society, how well our society, and through its current channels, is preparing people for a life of work. Um, and we're going to ask some, start to talk about sort of how technology is changing that and, and what technology can do to sort of improve the... Uh, that system to the extent that it's lacking. To discuss this, we have two shy, retiring, very unopinionated people up here to, 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 uh, to help us kick this discussion around. Uh, to my far left is Chip Posick, who's the co-founder and executive, uh, chief executive officer of 2U, which some of you may know is uh, known from its name up until a few months ago of tu Tutor. Um, and to my immediate left is uh, Peter Smith, who's a Senior Vice President for Academic Strategies and Development at Kaplan Higher Education Group, and uh, the, on, his, in, on the side, in his spare time, uh, the CEO of a new entity that he'll tell us a little bit, little bit about called Qualified. Um, so I'm going to give each of them a, a couple, three minutes to sort of d describe the perspective that they come at this conversation from and, and their product, projects, and, and then... Uh, We'll get into some questions. So maybe start with you, Chip. So, um, you know, first of all, Doug, thank you. Doug, I think, interviewed me in 2008 when we had six employees, I think. I think that's right. So uh, has known us a long time. But uh, to you, we, we were called Tutor until about four months ago. We partner with some of the world's best schools, one of which happens to be in the audience. Hello, Susan. And she's going to be on a panel later. later. Uh, so we partner behind the scenes with great universities to build what we believe are the world's best online degree programs. Until about two months ago, in which we announced an initiative called Semester Online that Walt Mossberg, if you were here this morning, talked about. We were pretty excited about that. Partnering with a, a, a group of top-tier uh, U.S. universities today, soon international, um, to offer undergrad courses for credit online. Uh, so we bring a perspective of, you know, when we started the company, I would say, this company was founded on the whole notion that you could do something not only as good but potentially better online if you had a great school like Chapel Hill that was willing to embrace the online modality in every way possible and make students equal to the on-campus students. Peter. Yeah, we're working at uh, Qualified and just want you to know that it really only has one eye um, <laughs> in the middle. Uh, just should you ever want to find the, uh, the website. Uh, what we're, we've been working for about a year and a half, and throughout this conversation at lunch, I'm going to move from the philosophical to the practical, because at the end of the day, I'm going to ask uh, anyone in this room that would like to help us think about what we've got and how to make it better, because we're in very early, really alpha, pre-alpha stage. So uh, we'd like some help if the people here would like to play with the product. Uh, but I, I think... In a nutshell, what it is, is an emerging ecosystem in which we can, first of all, tie to uh, the ONET database and all of the occupations and jobs in the United States uh, and create a profile for what you need to be good on that job on day one. The next thing we can do is take your LinkedIn download or your resume, an extended resume, and ultimately additional information and create a personal profile to you as to what your readiness is to do that job. And then we can search through open education resources and other ultimately paid resources to find the gap-filling learning that will take you from where you are to where you want to go. You notice I haven't talked about degrees, and this is where it gets philosophical. I believe that 
far too often degrees and certificates stand between degree, I'll stay with degrees for the time being for clarity, what a person actually needs right now and what we ask them to do in order to get what they need. And we wanted to, to clear that out. What is the number one thing you need? Is it, a, is it a job? Is it an economic consequence? And we're going to help you take everything you know to get there, and we're going to help you path your way towards that. At any time, as we go forward, you want to take all that and turn it into an academic result as opposed to an economic or career result, you can do that as well. So what we're trying to do is not improve the translation between learning and work and formal learning and work, but to obliterate it and put it in the hands of the learner so that they can, with coaching and advising and assessment, obviously, so that they can construct their own path towards the future. So the philosophy of it is very much to put the learner in charge and create a pull environment as opposed to the traditional push environment of standard academic program. Uh, well, that's, that's a really good transition to where I wanted to start, which is that uh, there's been a lot of talk in the last few years uh, driven by people like, like Peter Thiel and picked up with sort of surprising sense of uh, vigor by the New York Times and, and some other uh, journalistic entities these days, sort of arguing that our current system of uh, really questioning the value basically of a, of a college degree of, and of colleges, of higher education. Um, and, I, I, you know, I think there's um, really arguing that the system that I talked about that we have in place that Peter says he wants to obliterate um, isn't working very well and uh, in producing workers and, and citizens for our society. Um, so I guess I wanted to start and maybe start with Chip and let Peter come back to how much do you buy the argument that higher education is broken and, and what do you think are its major failings? And not, not even a little. So you, we're competing with the turkey pesto, so it's good you yes. started with something that gets me all lathered right. up. Yeah. Uh, I would say uh, P the Peter Thiel argument personally for me is a bit elitist and insulting. I'm, I'm going to give you some stats because you, people have read all the stats. 2011 Bureau of Labor Statistics, if you, the unemployment rate for somebody with a doctoral degree is 2.4%. Unemployment rate for somebody with a high school degree is 9.4%. I mean, it's, and it's a hockey stick. So if you, as you progress in education, you clearly do better in life. Average lifetime earnings of somebody with a doctoral degree is like $3.4 million. Somebody below a high school degree is like $900,000. So, but that's not the important thing. So let's talk about me. So I actually am the first person in my family to go to college. And I'm pretty proud of that. And my parents are amazing people, and I'd love for you to meet them at some point. You'd, you'd, you'd be fascinated by them. They're fascinating. They're awesome. But the fact is, George Washington University fundamentally changed my life. I got a scholarship to go to George Washington, and then I paid the rest of my way through loans. And the notion that you can have people drop out of college is the most insane elitist argument. And to make it even a little more personal, one of the Peter Thiel fellows has actually become a good friend of mine I go to these conferences that are called Founders now, which is really a really pretty amazing conference. But the point is, I've gotten to meet this guy named Sujay Tile. He's at Scopely, which is in LA. And he's at, when he was 15, he got into Harvard. OK, full stop, right there. How many people in this room got into Harvard when you were 15? <laughs> OK, Sujay, he dropped out, became a Peter Thiel fellow. Good for him. He's doing great. And the fact is, he's a brilliant young guy. And in Dublin, I was actually able to drink with him. Whereas here in the United States, I was not, because he's still not drinking. I mean, he's 20 years old. And so my point is, he's brilliant, and he is a unicorn. The rest of the world needs a great education. And I firmly believe that what we're doing today proves that you can do that online. But that really wasn't the question. The question is, the system broken? And so what I do think is a problem, if somebody goes into a, a degree of any kind, and they come out with a ton of debt, and they're actually not able to get a great job, I mean, we hang our hat on outcomes. It's all about what the outcome is, not, you know, not the, the necessarily are you getting the degree. What, what happens after you've gotten that degree? But ultimately, I, just, I don't think one can argue that the system that has built people and given me personally an opportunity to do what I'm doing today, which would not have existed without the infrastructure we have here in the United States. So I didn't mean to get Peter, all Peter, what about up you? No, I, uh, I would add, uh, I had somebody, well, over 40 years, I've had a lot of people say, you know, why do you think higher education should be available to more and more and more people? I mean, it, it, and that is a classic argument that goes on today in some places. To what, to your data, I would add two other points. 
people, the more education you have, the more you vote and participate in civic affairs, and the more education you have, the longer you live. So more money, more democratic participation, longer life. Pretty good data set to say that what we're about, one way or the other, is important. And That's I, the uh, lieutenant governor coming out. There, there you go. There you go. So what I meant, and, I and the person who has built two, in, who built two institutions from the ground up, right? So. <laughs> oh well. Um, so what I meant, I want to be very clear. Thank you for bringing up the obliterate comment right. because I didn't intend in any way to imply that we should obliterate higher education. I believe that higher education has become an obstacle too often between what somebody and I've spent most of my life with adult learners. They, they come back to school, and the way we've set the policy and the structures, they have to sign up for the whole Megillah to get what it is they may really want, which may not be the whole Megillah. Okay. So well, all I'm suggesting is, let, can't we put the pathway towards a degree uh, in the hands of the learner with advice and support, as opposed to asking them to do our thing in order to get their piece out of it? I think we lose adults all the time, and right. I think we lose traditional age undergraduates all the time because we aren't listening to what it is they need first. And if we would start making that the first purpose, we would get a heck of a lot more people to the ultimate so goal. what you're really talking about is blowing up the credentialing system, or at least, I mean, to the extent you're talking about obliterating somebody, no, because, I mean, am I right that the, that the credentialing is where the, I would, where, I, is, is, the is one of the major impediments? I would like, uh, one of the things we're working very hard on at Qualified is to have the credential, to have to create portraits of learners that add up with portraits of what you need to do to do a right. job, know and do to do a job well. Right. So that the too many degrees and certificates are proxies for something. We're trying to get underneath the proxy and say, what is it you gotta know and be able to do? And by the way, that does include cross-cutting intellectual skills. It well, includes problem solving. Right. But, what do you need to know? And what do we take to get but, you there? But don't you think that like what I what I loved about what Walter Mossberg said this morning is you know, I think it's also really I important didn't like to understand almost anything. Walter you didn't like anything said. We're talking about that. So, like the critical thinking skills that you have to have. Like the fact is, it's not. All, and the whole notion today that how many of you have hired somebody in the last year based on a badge? Yeah. Right. Well, the, I mean, that's the, the uh, that's so so. Here's here's what I want to get to because uh, you both touched on it. How, I mean, Chip, you talked about outcomes, and, and Peter, something you just said spurred this too. What, I mean, one of the things I think one of higher education's failings so far has been a failure to define what students should be able to, what students should know and be able to do at various stages of, of education. And, and, and I think that gets to the question. We've, we've let the degree of whatever, or whatever the credential is, but there have been a few, and the bachelor's degree has been king, um, be the sort of definer. And so, but I, but I do think there are some, and so there's all this talk about sort of improving, getting, di diving down and getting more clarity about what the skills and knowledge are that we want students to have, I think is really good. The danger I see, potentially, is that the skills and knowledge get defined very narrowly. Um, partly because a lot of the things that we know are important are harder to measure. Um, and you run the risk of uh, there's lots of talk now about really have, uh, tying uh, higher education outcomes primarily to job, job outcomes, salary one year out. Uh, I don't want to get Peter started on gainful employment necessarily, but, but and yet, and that the president of my I'm alma mater. gainfully employed. Right. The president of my alma mater, Princeton, has said that she really thinks that higher education ought to be defined by how the graduates do, uh, how successful they are at the 25th reunion. I think there's probably something in between right. those that might be a better uh, guidepost. But, but I guess, what, are, what do you see as the, how should we be measuring success and, and, and what well, students can do, well, graduates, right. Sorry, whatever? I, I actually believe that uh, if, you, if you cut out the 25% over here, which is only skill and vocational, and the 25% over here, which is all um, Aristotle, religion, and whatever, and take, take the middle 50, 60%, it's a false dichotomy to say that you cannot teach through the liberal arts and also through other media, other, other content, 
generally uh, cross-cutting intellectual skills and abilities. I mean, mm -hmm. we know for a fact that if somebody goes to an above average state university, studies English literature, does well and graduates, the odds are that they're gonna go out and have a successful career doing something. Because along with Elizabeth Barrett Browning or American history, they have learned how to write, to think, to read, even though those things were not being evaluated. See, we evaluate around, what, how'd you do on your history course? Not, oh, by the way, I not only know about the War of 1812 and the Trail of Tears, Okay, and the role that Andrew Jackson played in both, but I can write, think critically, and present arguments and make distinctions. We now have the ability to evaluate both. We can evaluate the content and we can evaluate the intellectual equipment that it takes to get you good at the content. And I would argue you can reverse that as well. So to me, in the middle of the spectrum, it's a false dichotomy that we need to get over. We now, somebody said, why are you doing this stuff? And one of the answers, a lot of people say, because we can. We have the tools to understand content differently. One of the things I'm really eager to, we're gonna talk later, figure out a way to do something with you, because I would like to be able to analyze your courses in an entirely different way towards what do they do for somebody in the job market as well as intellectually. So I think it's a false dichotomy, and I think Different people want to drive us down different rabbit holes in order to make another point about whether higher education is for everybody or not. What I want to figure out is, is Elizabeth Barrett Browning the only way to become a higher order intellectual thinker? I don't think so. I think there are, and it does, there are probably seven ways you can do that, ten mm -hmm. ways you, you can do it. Mm -hmm. False dichotomy. Chip. I, I guess I, I, would, I would speak a little bit from the 2U experience so far. So. Our first partner was the USC Rossier School of Education. Uh, we will always be thankful for Dean Karen Gallagher for actually agreeing to do this with us because it's pretty audacious. Startup shows up that has no platform, no curriculum, no funding, no anything. Uh, and the, what Karen was trying to do there, she was graduating about 80 teachers a year. And you know, you've heard many presentations earlier about how many new teachers are going to be needed over the next 20 years. It's a, it's a critical problem. And she wanted to move the dial, so this was not a business model to her. This was a mission. You know, she wanted to, to be relevant in teacher preparation. And so today, you know, we've been operating that program now since late 2009. And so she's gone from 80 students a year to more like 1,000-ish. And so we put about 3,000 students in that program. But the most important thing uh, to, to get to the question is that the job retention is equal to the on-campus program. And job placement in that particular program, which is the program we have the most graduates, we have right now I think 1,400 graduates, is, uh, is almost 90%. And that's in a teacher market that, you know, you certainly don't have to do anything but read the New York Times to understand how many teachers have been laid off over the last two years. So in a really challenged job market, that program is being rewarded for its quality by people getting jobs. And that's a very specific thing that you can measure. And you're, you're getting a teacher certificate, you're becoming a new teacher, do you get a job? Um, you know, we've now just most recently moved into undergrad education. That's a different issue. But if you apply what I just said to our programs overall, we now have graduates in three of our programs. We've got nine up and running, but we have three that have, that have actual, you know, people that are getting out. And ultimately, we believe that particularly in those degrees that are focused on a practitioner like nursing with Georgetown, you know, it's how you do in the field, ultimately. That's, That's right. what the faculty care about. Do you pass your boards? Are you a successful advanced practice nurse? How do you handle the operating room? Midwifery, can you deal with the complicated world of midwifery in, in, a, in a shortage in that market? So No, and I think Peter makes a very good point that um, this is not, uh, that it is a false dichotomy. I mean, anybody who's, I mean, I think that it gets a lot trickier to measure, to, to measure, define and measure outcomes at the undergrad level. Sure. Because it's less specifically about job placement. And all I'm saying is I'm worried. I don't want it to become too much about that. We've got a governor in a few states basically saying we don't need any more anthropologists because there aren't a lot of anthropology jobs. I'm not really sure that's, that's really the best way of, yeah, of looking at the world. But then and you so, think about it, like I was a political communication major. What am I doing that has anything to do with right. political communication? So, but, uh, yeah. And then if you think about it, even the even the comment around job skills and, and if you think about it, the tech world has always been, whether it be Microsoft certification or today, something like a company called Code Academy, which if you don't know, you should check it out. Very cool company, New York based, and effectively, um, you know, it's offering badges for people that are learning MongoDB. Many of you probably don't know what MongoDB is. I didn't know about it until we hired people in my coding group that had to code MongoDB. 
Never heard of it before in my life. But in that case, what do I care? I care that Chris Conlon, our senior software developer, can code MongoDB more than I care about how much he knows about American literature, right? right? right. So uh, I want to shift uh, a little more specifically to be about technology, given that's the nominal uh, purpose of this conference. So it's an understatement of, of epic proportions to say that MOOCs have gotten a lot of press and one might say hype uh, in the last uh, about 12, 14 months since Andrew Ng and Daphne Kohler were in our office uh, a little over a year ago talking about Coursera. Um, so I want to ask both of you how game-changing or not uh, are these are, are MOOCs, are, are these massive open online courses, and to the extent that you see them as transformative in some significant way, what will their main contributions be to, the, to, the move, to that movement? Peter? Well, I've had sort of a, a front row seat. I, I see MOOCs as the latest um, evolution or, or iteration coming, that starting with the open education resource movement in 2000, 2001 at MIT. And just to track it, I, I've had the, the honor of being on that advisory board from the beginning uh, when I didn't know what it was. I know they asked me to do it, and I said I'd be a fool to say no. And I was subsequently at UNESCO where we looked at uh, the cross-border issues of open education resources, because there are countries in the world that are pretty worried about Western and Northern countries flooding their, their airspace with a bunch of stuff that they have no control over. So we. It's been a discussion that's gone on for a long time. Mm -hmm. What changed immediately, and I was saying earlier today, within six weeks, it is a massive game changer, but it is not as an end in and of itself. It is because major institutions, and I, and I, would, and I would argue that uh, 2U is doing this in other ways, are, are in the center of the arena now saying, we are going to do this. Right. Rather so, than on the sidelines. Where absolutely. Been, right. So all of a sudden, some things, I've been following this conversation one way or the other for all, most of my career, and the technology has been the latest change. But to all of a sudden find all of the, discuss, the discussable items are now in the center of the arena because MITx said, we're going to do this, and bingo, bango, bongo, and then, and, with, and then then you go to uh, Coursera, Udemy, right. Udacity. It, it has changed the arena and the conversation. Right. Well, for better or worse, and I, you know, I, in, in a macro sense, it's probably worse, but we pay the most attention by far, and we as a society, and God knows journalists like, like uh, my in my profession do it, we focus on the elites, and uh, it would, the, the elites aren't always the, the best or the, <laughs> the leaders or whatever, uh, but they, it's their movements, their actions that are watched most closely. And here we have them, after largely staying on the sidelines, as you say, for a long time, uh, jumping into it in a big way. And I think they will have elevated the, you know, a whole lot of people who would have thrown distance education under the bus and, and dismissed it out of hand, faculty members, et cetera, some six, you know, a year ago. It's a lot harder to do when the big guys exactly are playing. Right. So, no I question. Now you're really going to get me started here. So. Uh, I would say, uh, without question, faculty perception of online education has changed dramatically in 12 months. And what's interesting about 2U is we've existed during this time where in 2008, we had everybody slamming the door in our face, genuinely. And you know, I, mean, I could give you a very, very long list of schools that are all in some form in the MOOC environment that slam the door, and I understand why. And we were fortunate enough to find a couple of pioneers, like Susan Cates from Chapel Hill, that were able to do it. But I will tell you that um, from a faculty perception standpoint, the world has entirely changed. And from my standpoint, very selfishly as a business person, anytime Harvard or, uh, or Duke or anyone at that level affiliates themselves with online education, that's clearly a positive because the biggest challenge for our company is very simply that preconceived notions of online education are still bad. And they're wrong. They are definitively wrong. We have tons of data that proves that it is excellent extraordinarily high quality, outcomes are high quality. Now, when you go across the globe, and we've done all these surveys, it gets worse as you go from here to Asia, um, and you have to put Brazil where Asia is today. So if the US preconceived notions about online education are still not great, in Europe they're worse than here, in Asia they're a lot worse, and in Brazil they're about where Asia is. So people still think online is not any good at all. Mm -hmm. So we love what the MOOCs have done there. Mm -hmm. and at the same time, I would say that you know, the, the, uh, I'm going to give you my best Boston accent here, of, uh, which is terrible, by the way, because I'm a South Floridian, so I 
can't even, I'm gonna try though. So for those of you from Boston, so there's a great quote that Matt Damon says in Goodwill Hunting. And he says, and two, you dropped 150 grand on an F in education you could have gotten for $1.50 in late charges at the public library. And the, the way that's relevant is the, you know, his argument at the time, which Robin Williams ends up saying, if you've seen the movie, ends up proving that it's much more than just content acquisition. That has a role. But in our universe of online education, we talk about four pillars. And the reality is the content is one of them. But it is truly, at the end of the day, probably the least important of the four pillars. And I mean, I can tell you as much as you want to know about that, but the content piece is not what is making these undergrad, I mean, with these graduate education programs so strong. It's important, don't get me wrong. You have to know what a balance sheet is. But it's the intimacy of that, those, these incredible faculty members that you're working with on a daily basis that I think changes it, at least in our right. case. Well, let me, let me just, uh push you just a little more um, is the implication, and uh, there will be a possible rebuttal later from some of the others, but I mean, do you, so do you, at this point, would you argue that the MOOCs are primarily just another type of content? I mean, no, or, I mean, or, or, look, I think they are, I think what, what uh, Daphne and Andrew have done, particularly in Coursera, there's a lot of really high quality work being done in Coursera, mm -hmm. pushing the edge. Um, you know, if you think back to the teaching company, uh, which is based in DC, offering great professors on tape for years, and, and they've done quite well with that model. Um, there is clearly a need internationally for the type of educational experience being offered by the MOOCs. Unfortunately for us, I've been on like six panels with Daphne in the last six months because we end up getting put up there as the anti-MOOC. Somebody actually even here even said it to me uh -huh. this morning. We're not an anti-MOOC. Sure. We think everything they're doing is really smart, but we're definitively not open and we're definitively not right. free. Right. So. Sure. So I, think, I think the implications of the MOOCs are not, I said, it's not an end in itself. For instance, what we find it qualified is that the notion of the degree as a proxy is, is weakened. People are identifying it for what it is and relating the failure of the proxy to the failure to be prepared for work or to be prepared well for future academic study. Uh, so what happens is when you challenge one aspect of boundary setting, and that is what the MOOC has done by participation and mode and all of that, and numbers. You then, by definition, put assessment on the, on, in the arena. Are, is it really only one way to assess learning? And is it really a faculty member in a lecture or in a small room with the door or closed? Or is it peers? Or, or is or it peers? Record. Or is it other subject matter experts? Or is it tests? Or is it demonstrations? The fact is, and what, so you're, you come, they've opened the door to a world of massive unbundling and rebundling of the post-secondary value proposition. And frankly, I don't think there's going to be any one model anymore. I think there's going to be a whole bunch of different ways of getting where you want to go. We've, we've picked one path that qualified simply because we think by using assessment mechanisms and open resources and letting learners do a lot of the work themselves with, with support and advice, that in fact, they are then moving themselves closer to an ultimate goal, employment or, or degree, without paying us a heck of a lot of money. So all of a sudden, the, tu the concept of tuition as an annual thing goes away, and the concept of the price of, is what you pay to get the degree when you finally say, I want the degree. And so what happens is you, you've taken the traditional economic model and cost structure and understanding of cost and flipped it on its head. I think MOOCs have made all of that, interestingly enough, they've legitimized all these other corollary conversations that don't have to do with content. And I would agree, I think yeah. content is becoming one, a One other thing that I would add to that is I do think that the, the, the celebrity nature of teaching is really important, and I think uh, that would not have happened without the MOOCs. I mean, mm -hmm. it is becoming more and more important on campus that you are a great teacher, in part because you're delivering it to a wider audience of people, or even in our case, where it's not, uh, you know, we don't operate in millions, that's not what this is, but the fact that the, the, the faculty are embracing online education in a way that they wouldn't have in the past. I mean, I, I think it, both good points, and I think the, I mean, the, the pushback that I tend to have, and I guess it's just my nature as a, as a journalist, I'm sort of born skeptical, just this idea that, I mean, we are so, this is so nascent, and you're right, it has so immediately changed the conversation, and yet the, all the things you described about alternative credentials, these take, 
I mean, it's the sort of fantabulism that, that sort of uh, gets me, that gets me to recoil a little bit and sort of say, hold on. I mean, I, I find myself, I know it's a dirty word in the wake of the UVA, the UVA situation at Ter and Teresa Sullivan, but I'm become a little bit of an incrementalist. I think things move a lot more slowly uh, because, because uh, structures need to change, but it has absolutely blown these conversations right. wide open. So, um, so uh, again, focusing a little more on technology. So what would you say are the biggest uh, limitations of the role of technology in higher education? Um, are there things uh, that we seem to be looking to technology to do or to help with that we shouldn't? And are there areas in which technology could actually be uh, the wrong path and, and destructive? I, it's, if, the, if the classroom has been a black box and all technology does or did was become another black box, just something that we use to create access, mm -hmm. then, then in fact, uh, it, we have been stupid and, and it has failed. Uh, it seems to me that what the door that technology opens is, uh, and I'll, I'll give you, just give you an example. I'm a model builder, you know, I start colleges and I think this way. Mark Hopkins on the log. How many people know about the whole notion of Mark Hopkins uh, having a Socratic dialogue on the log? He was a president of Williams or someplace 100 years ago. People familiar with mm -hmm. that at all? A couple of people mm -hmm. are. <laughs> well, OK, so we, we're, we're down the vocational route already. Now, so think of the Socratic dialogue. We can create a Socratic dialogue and a highly personalized relationship between a person who knows a lot about something and one to 20 people who share a common interest. It can be done electronically and with social networking with some blending or not. We can do that today, creating the highest kind of personalization and customization with the highest quality of interaction around content, if, you want to, if that's the way you want to think about it. That is using technology to go back to the future almost, or the, the other way around, to go back to what is considered to be one of the best educational modes or models ever, which is conversation between interested people and somebody who knows what it is they're talking about. That is a creative use of technology. And the fact of the matter, if any one of us could start that college tomorrow if we had the cash and the vision and wanted to do it. Can I hit on that yeah, one specifically? Please. So yeah. it's interesting. So our Wash U, uh, we find one great school that wants to, in our opinion, build the world's best program. And so we only partner with one, it's one of the more controversial aspects of the company is that we partner philosophically with one school in each discipline. And so our partner for law is the Wash U, Washington University School of Law, uh, great school. But the dean, we knew that if you think about our four pillars, one of our pillars is live classes. So you go to class every week. Um, actually, in a kind of crazy small world thing, I actually have class tonight at 9 o'clock Eastern time because I'm in our MBA program. That's a whole other thing. But uh, so you have to go to class once a week and you're live with, looks a bit like the Brady Bunch. And so we knew we could do the Socratic method mm -hmm. in the live classes with no problem. But the dean actually threw a challenge out at us and he said, I want an asynchronous version of the Socratic method and then I want to do it in live session. So we did this very cool crowdsourcing version of the Socratic sure. method that I think is actually very clever. That doesn't really answer your question, but I felt like I wanted to toot my <laughs> horn a little bit there. So, but to answer your question specifically, something that doesn't work, one of our key four pillars is this, the fact is the notion of what an online program is today is a very difficult thing to define. And so in all of our programs, there is a live component that typically if, if you're in nursing, for instance, you're in social work, we find, one of the reasons we have so many employees is we actually find a physical placement for you in Idaho or in Montana or in Colorado, wherever you are, and you go in and you are in the field with a preceptor trained by Georgetown. So the reason I bring that up is your question about what could be dangerous. The notion of having a fully online advanced practice nursing degree, I don't want to go to that hospital. I'm sorry, I don't. You know, I've, I've got a problem in my body. I don't want to go to the hospital where it was 100% fully online. That is actually extraordinarily difficult to do. That's one of, truly, inside the company at 2U, that is without question one of the harder parts of running this business, is you've got to find a qualified placement for this person. You have to find sure. a preceptor to put with them, because at the end of the day, there's no digital babies. So that, that would be my answer to the, the dangerous thing. Um, ready to turn it over to the audience for some questions. Uh, there are microphones out in the... Uh uh, in the in the 
hallway in the uh, alleyways. So please raise your hand if you have a question for. Uh, it's, to, it's in the realm of other duties as assigned. Please don't be shy. Uh, uh -oh. in the, uh, okay. Please could make you, some comments. Could you please, please make keep your title short? Please, yes, please make them uh, com questions, not comments, and, and uh, identify I'm, yourself. I'm Jim. Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, <laughs> we, know, we know who you are. You know who I am, yeah. So uh, it's interesting when academics talk about careers or ask to, they usually divert to a different subject. So my, my question is this. Um, if we're going to fix the career problem, it's actually a question. I know the answer. I want to know if you know the answer. Okay. When actually do human beings make fundamental decisions about careers? When do what? People were laughing at your humor. So Say can that again, ask it again? We, we lost it. At what age do human beings make fundamental decisions about careers? Good this decisions or any decisions? Fundamental decisions about what they are likely to do, what they're capable of doing, what they have the drive and motivation to do. I feel like I should plead the fifth because you clearly know the answer. Yeah, so. why don't you just tell us in, instead of uh, it turns out teasing us? It's a little younger with girls. For girls, very, it's about very, eight to ten, yeah. and for boys, it's about ten to twelve. I'd love to see that data. Yeah, and when I, I was I eight, I thought I was going to be an astronaut. Yeah, and, so. and is that is that model? Is that model? Is it, does I know it work? lots of astronauts that wear scarves on. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> hey, um, look, Carolina Blue, you gotta love the, it. The, the point is this, the, the point is this, if we're talking about fixing the careers problem, I'm not sure that college is really the place to fix it, the deep career problem, which is how you get people linked with their aptitudes and their interests to what they're actually going to do. Oh, and, and as a scientist, I, I understand that I've heard that data and I understand why you're saying what you're saying. Here's the deal. If, in my case, you spent your career working with marginalized adults, some of whom have high school diplomas, some don't, some of whom have some college and no degree, some have the high school diploma and no credit, the fact of the matter is blaming it on somebody got it wrong when they were eight years old doesn't help them a bit. So somebody else can work on that problem. What what I'm working on in my way, and what Chip's working on in his way, and a lot of other people in this room are working on their ways. Okay, here's a clear and present problem. Here's, here's the issue we've got. We've got millions of people who we know have God-given talent, or wherever they got it from, and we have not figured out how to tap that talent. We have not figured out how to help them be positive, productive learners, and tie that to something that lifts their heart when they work, hopefully. And so, I just don't think it's a question that takes you any place other than out the window. Um, I agree we need to work, do way better in elementary school, but that's not what we're here talking about. So uh, it's, a, it's a good question, but I'm not going to write off 36 million adults with a co with high school diploma and some college uh, uh, who will solve the, the immediate problem if we get it right with uh, some of them. Of, of the gap in skills and the need for a better workforce in this country, that's just where I'm putting my time and effort. And what we're doing at Qualified, we're not saying it's going to be you know, uh, some Big Ten famous research university. We're saying it's going to solve problems for people that have economic implications and then have academic implications. And we're pretty proud of what we're doing. Next, but, que next question. We have a next question. Okay, right? please. Hi, uh, Aparna Mukherjee. At, at one point, I launched the New York Times uh, Knowledge Network, which was an online learning platform. Um, my question has to do with this gap, this skills gap that we talk about a lot. And um, there's a McKinsey report from last month that talked a lot, uh, among a lot of different data points, about the perception gap between what graduates and potential employers um, think in terms of how well graduates are prepared for the workforce and what educators and trainers think. And I'm wondering both just the overall perspective of how do you, do, how do you address this, how do you measure it, that part, but then how the, the online distance kind of component, I'm not sure if that makes it easier to gauge this and to determine whether someone is qualified mm -hmm. or whether that physical kind of distance makes it even more of this kind of sense of are these people who are graduating with these virtual degrees really prepared to do in real life types of work? I think, I think you've got it too extremely, too extremely <laughs> divided. But I read the report. I think it's a great report. And for those of you who don't know it, basically what 
McKinsey did was create a knowledge structure and organize information in a way it had never been organized before. And what they found out was, regardless of age, essentially, and regardless of country, employers, students, and educators live in parallel universes. They, they have different assumptions. They have different commitments. They have different values. They have different priorities. And it's a train wreck of mammoth proportions. The survivors survive, and everybody else goes away. I mean, that, that's, about, that's about the way it works. Um, what, I, what I would argue very strongly, what we're trying to do, it isn't about online or not online, and I really don't think it's about content. I agree we were using it in a different frame, but I don't think this is about content. What, the, what you can do better than ever before, for example, somebody says, I think I want to be an accountant. We can show them all the accounting jobs within 25 miles of where they're sitting, say it's a 28-year-old female. We can show them the low salary and the high salary. We can show them the, the knowledge, skills, and abilities they need. And if there are legal requirements, we can show them the legal requirements. We can also then show them what their learning, their knowledge profile looks like and what, what they need to have as knowledge, skills, abilities they can apply to be an accountant. And then we can bring in the resources to get them from point A to point B. The point is, it isn't the online, it's the data, it's the information, it's the, and, and then we can add a behavioral assessment. So if you want to be a nurse and you vomit when you see blood, probably not a good combo. Uh, so we can do, so we can do uh, the behavioral, uh, which is critically important, I think, to why people, not why they get jobs, but how they keep jobs or get better in their job, often has much less to do with knowledge, skills, and abilities and much more to do with the way they're wired up. And you are wired up at birth. I mean, that isn't something you get. So you can't change much of that. So that's the way I would, I would get into what you're saying, is what we're trying to do is not job on those three parallel universes into all changing, but to linking them with good data about results what's needed, where they go, how they get there, what they need, all of that, whether you're an employer or a person or a college, so that they're all playing off common language and a common script. That, that I think, and then your courses, we could analyze your courses as easily as anybody else's to have them be useful to the journey that the individual person is on. Chip, you two, add two quick things. Uh, the online versus on campus thing, the, what you do really have going for you is vast amount of data online. That's right. And you have a limited amount of visibility as to what happens in the classroom. That's number one. Number two, just a couple examples from our partner schools. The Rossier School recently announced a commitment to all the teachers that they graduate that if they struggle or if their students struggle with gains in the classroom, they will permanently retrain them, which I thought was amazing. And then Chapel Hill announced mm -hmm. an MBA for life so that if a student wants to come back, because all the class sessions are, you can ultimately, you know, what's pretty crazy is I could go back eight years from now and watch my derivatives class week two. And so beyond that, they're actually offering the live component on a permanent basis as you become an MBA student, which I think sure. is... So the one, one thing I would throw in there is that I, I think one of the tricks, I think, that to, to, to answering this question is there's a, there's a real mismatch even within, on the employer side. You've got CEOs talking about how they want their, their workers to, be, uh, to have the critical thinking and communication skills and the softer skills. And then the people out there doing the hiring uh, on the HR side are typically looking for much more defined industry specific skills. And I think until that mismatch gets worked through, there's going to be, it's going to be a challenge. I'd be interested to see how, the, how you guys do, will end up defining what the well, I careers think want. In the larger, well, I, to, that, to that end, because we're going to be out of time in a minute, I yeah. want to um, do my two minutes of, uh, of, of advertising. If we are, we are looking for what I have called in earlier times in my career, critical friends. I mentioned this at the beginning. Our URL is the qualified, the qualified. Um, there are four or five people standing in the back there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands up if people want to take a look. We got some people that would like to talk to you about it because we would love for you to come to us. Uh, we will then send you an email inviting you to participate and just Tell us what, this thing is so raw right now that we can benefit, um, we think we got a hell of an idea, but we can really benefit from your engagement with us and telling us what's Equal time working. provision? <laughs> sure. No, it's actually very funny. It's very rare to see a 2U thing anywhere because we actually don't promote 2U at all. 
we're inherently behind the scenes. We promote Chapel Hill and Georgetown and so on and so forth. So I really don't have anything else to say. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem is I put your napkin somewhere and I can't find them. <laughs> I think we're out of time. Uh, I think we're out of time. My, uh, is that, uh, anyway, thank you for your time. Thanks to Chip and, and Peter.